Good morning. Uh, before I begin, I would like to ask you not to switch off your mobile phones. So leave them on. You can mute them, but I want you to have the mobile phone with you because I, what I talk about today is also related to mobile phones. When you look at the display of your mobile phone, you will see next to the radiation part, you will see letters like 3G, 4G, sometimes you will see LTE. And obviously these are uh, designations for the third and fourth generation of mobile phones because mobile phones have come a very very long way we use them today you probably use them every day in order to send messages or pictures to find your way around town to buy books or to buy train tickets uh, to watch films so these mobile phones are really fantastic uh, especially when you compare them to the first generation mobile phone which was a brick literally 30 three centimeters high, it weighed about a kilo and cost $4,000 and it had a battery life of one hour. So mobile telephony has come a very, very long way and uh, why am I talking about this today? Because there is more to come. What we are waiting for now is the next generation of mobile phones, which as you may have guessed is called 5G and you probably read about 5G every day in the papers. Now, with the arrival of 5G, with the fifth generation, we will be able to send even greater amounts of data, there's more capacity, and the data will be sent much faster, it will be more secure and more reliable. And this is very important because 5G is the technology which is used for self-driving cars, for telemedicine or for the famous Internet of Things, Industry 4.0 it is sometimes called, where all companies in the value chain are connected uh, digitally uh, in order to work together. So it's very important that these uh, communication devices are secure and reliable. And I just wanted to give you an example as to what 5G will bring to you. Uh, you can download a digital book in 3.2 milliseconds. This is even less than the blink of an eye. And even for an HD film, it'll only take you less than five seconds. So this is really a new technology that is crucial for technological progress in a large number of fields. But, as you may have seen, the introduction of 5G communications is a very long and complex process and I want to look at one aspect which I think could be improved in order to speed up the deployment of 5G because we are in Europe somewhat lagging behind the US and China and the one aspect I want to talk about is radio spectrum because you have probably never thought about, or most of you will not have thought about, how all these sounds and pictures and films and data get to your mobile phone and what actually allows you to send digital information in large amounts around the world. Now, the answer to this is radio waves. Radio waves are a type of electromagnetic waves and they are normally created by putting an alternating current through a piece of metal, such like an antenna. And these radio waves, they have fantastic characteristics. They travel at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, and they are invisible for the most part. And maybe that's also why they were discovered fairly late, only in the second half of the 19th century. There was a Scottish scientist by the name of James Maxwell who laid the theoretical foundations. He presumed that these electromagnetic waves existed, but it was only in 1887 that the German physicist Heinrich Hertz actually showed that radio waves exist. Tragically, uh, Mr. Hertz who already died at the young age of 36, he did not realize the practical importance of his radio wave experiment. And when he was asked about the possible applications of his discovery, 
He said, nothing, I guess. Now, how wrong he was. It was only a few years later that an Italian engineer by the name of Marconi found a way to transmit sound and radio waves and thereby developed the first radio. And it went on. Over time, the discovery of these electromagnetic waves has brought us not only radio, television, mobile communications, but a host of other applications such as radar, microwave ovens, ultrasonography, x-rays, and many more. Now, the problem I want to touch upon with you is how can we keep all these different electromagnetic waves apart? How do, we, how do we make sure that they don't get all mixed up? The answer lies in a classification of these waves by the length of, their wa of the waves. So depending on how fast the direction or the application of the current, of the electric current, changes, radio waves have a different length. So, if the direction of the current changes very, very quickly, the waves are very, very short, and if it doesn't, then the waves are much, much longer. This wavelength, by the way, is called frequency, and the unit to measure it is called hertz. You will have heard of kilohertz and megahertz, which is a thousand or a million hertz, and these are waves that are already very, very short, and altogether these electromagnetic waves make up the electromagnetic spectrum. And this spectrum ranges from extremely short waves like gamma rays to very, very long waves which you use for underwater transmissions or for very long distance communications. And as you can see here, there's only a very small part of the spectrum that is visible to the human eye. And that's the uh, part between the ultraviolet and the infrared. You, some of you may be able to see this uh, 400 to 700 nanometers. A nanometer is a one billionth of a meter. Extremely, extremely short, extremely small. Now, for the rest, these electromagnetic waves are invisible to us, which is probably just as well, because otherwise we would be very, very confused because there are lots of these waves flying around us every day. Uh, now, in order to avoid interferences between all these different services which use radio waves, it was decided that certain services should be provided only in certain parts, designated parts of the radio spectrum. And this is very similar to what you see in the street every day. There's a sidewalk for pedestrians, there's a cycle path, there's a bus lane, and then there's a normal driving lane for cars. And these lanes go in two different directions. And just like in street traffic, where we avoid collisions by using different lanes, there are specific frequency bands, for example, for radio and for TV or for mobile communications. You see VHF, UHF, uh, mobile telephony starts at about 800 megahertz here and goes up further. Below this we have television and radio. Now, um, when you look at your phone, you also see sometimes underneath the little uh, pie-shaped radar, you see little arrows that go up and down. These show you the up and down loads uh, as they happen uh, on some of these devices. So something which you download from the internet, for example, or something which you upload, like a picture that you want to send to a friend. Now, <coughs> this is all very good, but then the next question is, of course, who decides how the radio spectrum is divided between the various services and who can do what in a given frequency band. Who does actually own this radio spectrum? Well, the answer is no one. Radio spectrum is a public good, just like air, and since it is owned by the general public, the government of every country decides traditionally for its own territory who can do, who can use which radio waves and for which service, and sometimes also for which technology. Um, this happens 
in practice through the granting of so-called usage rights. The operators, the broadcasters, mobile operators, they get usage, usage rights and these usage rights are extremely valuable because you can do very, very good and valuable things with them, like mobile communications. In the year 2000, when the radio frequencies, the spectrum for the third generation mobile phones were sold in Germany by way of an auction, they fetched 50 billion euros just for the radio spectrum, just for something which is invisible and which you can use in order to provide mobile communications. So every government in Europe normally grants these rights to use a certain part of the radio spectrum for mobile services or other services. Now, this is fine if it's done at the national level as long as we talk about purely national services. Garage door openers, local radio stations, there's no problem. But what about services and devices that need to work cross borders? When you cross a border, when you go somewhere else, you want your mobile phone to work and you also want to receive something on your laptop. So here it would be very unfortunate if every country chose its own different frequency band for a certain service. This would cause interferences and it would not allow you to receive the transmissions that you want to receive. In the 1990s, for example, if you took your mobile phone to the US, it didn't work there because there was a different frequency band that was used and also different technology at the time. So in order to avoid this, in order to make this uh, workable at a cross-border level, people started to harmonize the allocation of frequencies at the European and also at the international level. At the international level, <coughs> there is a body under the auspices of the UN that organizes conferences every three to four years. They're called World Radio Communications Conferences. And there, thousands of people come together from virtually all countries around the world, and they decide international rules in order to find out what happens in which spectrum band, who can do what in certain parts of the frequency bands. These rules are radio regulations and they are kind of a, a basic global order of what happens with the radio spectrum. There is <coughs> there's a more detailed process at the European level where also frequency bands and technical specifications are identified in common by the member states and all this process is led by the European Commission. Now, <coughs> this is very important because there's one thing I haven't mentioned yet but which you may be able to guess by looking at the picture. Radio spectrum is limited. The amount of radio spectrum cannot be increased but what we can do is we can reduce the amount of spectrum which is needed for a certain service. You may have seen that a few years ago digital TV arrived and for digital TV you need much less radio spectrum than for the old analog TV and there was a whole frequency band that was freed. This was the 800 megahertz band and where 4G mobile telephony is presently provided. There are similar plans now to free another band for 5G, but this is still a few years down the road. So the bottom line is that through better cooperation, we can try to ensure that the limited amount of radio spectrum is used intelligently and efficiently. And I think and I hope that more will be done at the European level in order to make sure that we will very soon have 5G services in Europe. The process of spectrum assignment is, is underway in some countries, others are still behind, but we hope that in two to three years everything will be up and running. So, let me finish by just saying what is the takeaway from all this? Well, there are two things. We can push our limits if we work together and if we build on what others have done before us. Mr. Maxwell, he presumed there were these electromagnetic waves. Mr. Hertz showed that they were actually there but didn't know what to do with them. And then <coughs> Mr. Marconi came along and took up the baton, produced the first radio and lots of other services will come later on. The second thing that we can maybe 
take away from this is that even things which have physical limits can be stretched if we work together and if we find a way to somehow organize this limited amount of uh, resources intelligently. Thank you very much. Thank you.